Thank you for taking the time to listen to Pastor Eddie's Bible study. Due to the nature of the discussion, he would ask that you would listen to all his answers and responses to each statement and question that has been asked. I want to start this evening with something that happened to me. I've not been a big believer in predestination, but a week ago this last Saturday, I was in the Clearwater Library, and I always check out the new books. There's a section where they keep the new books. And there's a picture of Tim Tebow and his new book. The title of this book is Shaken. What do we do when we're shaken? Now, it might be fair to ask, what does a young man like Tim Tebow know about being shaken? I mean, he has, he's had an illustrious career in college, even if it was the wrong college. <laughs> he won a Heisman Trophy, which very few people ever have the honor of doing that. But his dream, his whole life, was to be a quarterback in the NFL. And it looked like that was going to work out too, but it didn't. He was cut by the Denver Broncos after playing less than one season, taking them to the playoffs, but there was no Super Bowl. Next, he was cut by the New York Jets and finally by the New England Patriots, where he never played one game. And his career is over. His football career is over. So he knows something about that. He also knows something about that through his foundation, where he links up with children who have the worst possible diseases. And many of those became trusted friends that he's lost. One of the things that he points out as a way of dealing with these times is not new. As a matter of fact, Pastor Eddie gave me a book several years ago about why bad things happen to good people. And one of the things that this book reminded me of is when you're dealing with these things, one strategy that you can use is to be a blessing to someone else. And as you're a blessing to someone else, those blessings are returned to you. So I want to encourage you, whether you're shaken or not, to be a blessing to people. I don't just mean people here. This is, this is easy. We know each other. It's not out of our comfort zone to be nice to somebody, but how about a complete stranger? The next time somebody opens the door and holds the door for you because you've you got groceries in your hands, or you, you know, and they open the door for you, just look them in the eye and say, thank you. God bless you. When you're at a restaurant and they bring you the bill, be generous. Be extra generous. And then write on the bill, great service. Little things. They don't have to be, you don't have to cure cancer. You know, just, just be nice. I'm going to start in the last DVD. They mentioned the Aryan controversy. This is between Eddie's favorite bishop, Athanasius, and a man by the name of Arius. Athanasius is the bishop of Alexandria, which is probably the third or fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, certainly one of the most important. Arius is a presbyter in the same city, but he has some ideas that Athanasius doesn't agree with. Now I want you to imagine, and this is going to stretch your imagination, but there's a reason. You come into church on Sunday expecting to hear another great sermon. But this Sunday, Pastor Eddie is up there and he's wailing. He's getting everybody excited. We're speaking in tongues and rolling around on the floor. Man, we're getting so excited. It's those Baptists down the road. they got to be wiped out. And we're so excited that we rush home, get our shotguns and our torches, and we march east down Highway 40, shoot up the place, and burn down the Baptist church. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, in self-defense, you don't think the Baptists are going to roll over, do you? At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they get their shotguns and torches, march west down Highway 40, come in here, shoot up the place, and burn the church down. 
And you say, well, that's stupid. Nobody would ever do that. Well, I don't know about that. That's exactly what happens when the followers of Athanasius and Arius get riled up against each other. There are riots in the street. People are killed. Churches are burned down. Pick up your uh, hymnals, if you will. Turn to page 881. I'm sure that's familiar. 881. You've all turned to that before. The Apostles' Creed that we say every Sunday. Right? Many of you know it. You don't have to pick up the hymnal. You've just memorized it. Have any of you ever wondered, over to the left is the Nicene Creed? Here's their disagreement. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to later. I'm going to skip down. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. This is the Nicene Creed, it's the orthodox belief of people at that assembly in 325. But Arius doesn't agree with that. Arius says, Jesus is not the one God. He's the Son of God. He sits at the right hand of God. But he's not equal to, or he is not the same as, God. Well, this really gets under Athanasius' skin, and the trouble begins. Constantine sees this as a divisive struggle within the church and he doesn't want any of it. Remember, Constantine wants to use Christianity to hold the Roman Empire together. He wants to create glue here, not disharmony. And so he calls the bishops together um, at Nicaea in 325 and the Nicene Creed is the result uh, of, the, of that conclave. So, where am I? Oh, yeah, I did want to say that each one of these people do have Scripture on their side. They can point to Scripture that supports their position. They didn't just dream up this idea. Of course, we have Athanasius who can point to John, but we also have... Uh, Arius, and he can point to several places in the Gospels where Jesus is at the right hand of God, and he can also point to Paul. In the epistle to Timothy, Paul says, I have come, well, has Jesus saying, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Two entities. One here, one who sent me. So both men can point to Scripture to support their case. This, w this disagreement would last longer than they do. And as a matter of fact, it probably still is in some disagreement today. Okay. The big question that I have, and all those books that I gave you, Nobody answers the question. How could this happen? Less than a quarter of a century before, Christians are being persecuted. And now, all of a sudden, 25 years later, Christians are killing each other. Now what's going on here? I started thinking about, it. is this like original sin? Or does it just mean that we're weak and we follow people that get us excited? I had a thought just today. Maybe it was because Christians for the first time had political power. For 300 years they didn't have any. 
Now, things matter. Constantine made that possible. And Constantine made it possible for Christians to build churches, to not be persecuted, to build a great religion, the Catholic Church. But before that, they didn't. So maybe, maybe that's, for the first time, they have power now. There was a British politician, Lord Acton, that said in the 19th century, all power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Maybe they just didn't know how to deal with having some power. Anyway, interesting thought. When I was putting this together, I thought about covering a wide number of people that were influential in the early development of the church. And I decided to only concentrate on one and do a little more in-depth on him. And that person is the namesake for a city in Florida, the oldest city, uh, continuous acting city in the United States, and that's St. Augustine. Which leads us to mispronounce his name, which is Augustine. So I'll try to use that if I don't forget. Uh, I think I went too far. No, I didn't. Um, yeah. There we go. Augustine is born in North Africa in 354. Present day Algeria, right about in here. Near Carthage. Remember, Carthage was called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. It were the ships coming from Carthage loaded with grain and fruits that went to Rome. Were it not for North Africa, much of the Roman Empire might have starved. Um, Augustine is born of a pagan father and a Christian mother. Her name is Monica. She'll play an important role in his life. But he doesn't start out as a Christian. He starts out uh, studying philosophy, and he is a follower of Manny. Unfortunately, in one of my previous uh, discussions, I was going to talk about Manichaeism, but we didn't have time. So I'm going to touch shortly on what that means, what Manny meant. Manny is the founder of Manichaeism. He's born in 261. He travels widely and settles in Persia. Uh, but his believers stretch all the way from the Roman Empire to China. So it's very widespread, more widespread initially than Christianity. There are two gods, where have you heard this before? A god of light and a god of darkness. And man is the battleground. Man can make his own decisions because he has free will and he maintains his own redemption through his actions. Jesus is fully God, so Jesus has a role in this religion. And the virgin birth is an absolute obscenity, according to Manny. Uh, because Jesus is not human. This Manichaeism would be uh, made heresy by the Catholic Church by the 4th century. And Augustine is a follower of Manny for nine years, not Christian. Augustine leads a wild life in the big city of Carthage. He takes a mistress, her name is Una. They live together for 15 years, and she gives him a child, a son named Adiadotus. In his study of philosophy and religion, he travels to Rome. Um, but he's still a follower of Manny, but he's beginning to question his religion. He would later move to Milan, which is in the northern part of Italy. So if Rome is about there, Milan is about there. Um, he asks Bishop Ambrose, uh, or asks to study under Bishop Ambrose. 
He's 32 years old, and his mother comes to live with him. She convinces him to give up his concubine, and she must have been thrilled when he kicks her out the door. But he soon takes another, and he says in his book, Give me chastity, but not yet. Now, he learns of two army officers with promising careers who give up their military career to become monks in a monastery. This is the beginning of the monastic period. Why would two people do such a thing, he wonders. He hears a strange voice. Take and read is the voice. In front of him is a Bible that's already open. He walks up to the Bible and he reads this verse. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Romans 13. Augustine converts almost immediately. He asks Bishop Ambrose what he should do and how he can be baptized. He would be baptized along with his son at the same time. This would have been a great time for Augustine, but in that same year, his mother Monica dies, and a year after that, his son also dies, shaken. He goes back to home in North Africa, to Carthage. He begins to preach in a small town outside of Carthage by the name of Hippo. And he is, because of his eloquence, made bishop of the church in Hippo. This is all about 391. So why do we look up to Augustine? I, I have to say, in the last maybe 100 years or so, Augustine's sort of been lost. Um, I don't know why, but he has. He advanced the idea of predestination, which is still with us today. If you flick on the radio or your TV and you see Joel Osteen talking about how God has you in the palm of his hand, predestination is alive and well. His other idea, or another idea, God and man are far apart because of original sin. We're all tainted because of it. Um, this is interesting because if you remember, we talked about Constantine waiting till he was almost dead to be baptized so his slate would be clean before his maker. This was a common belief. Augustine changes this because if you're tainted with original sin, then you already have sin. Even the little baby has sin. This would encourage people to have their baptisms earlier in their life rather than later. This is an opposition to a man by the name of Pelagius. Pelagius is a bishop that comes from depending on who you want to believe, either Britain, Scotland, or Ireland. They all claim him. Um, where am I? Oh, yeah. Uh, Pelagius is born in 354, and he preaches that man is saved by his good works. This runs counter to Augustine's uh, philosophy, which, of course, is based on Paul. This concept, this Pelagianism, is condemned by the Catholic Church in the early 5th century and fades into oblivion. Okay, where am I? Um, Augustine is apparently unconcerned that while Jesus said the end of days was coming very soon, four centuries have passed, and the end of days has still not come. Augustine predicts that certain things have to happen 
before the end of days. I don't know how he comes up with the one I'm going to talk about, which is that the Jews will convert to Christianity. Uh, maybe Pastor Eddie can help me with that, but I don't remember reading that in any scripture. But that's, that's his idea. Which is interesting because the man we also know that helped lead the Reformation, Martin Luther, had the same idea. He probably got it from Augustine. For 20 years, Martin Luther tries to convert the Jews to Christianity. But he doesn't. And after 20 years, he gives up and begins to call the Jews all kinds of dirty names. Um, and at one point says that all the property from the Jews should be confiscated, given to the church, and the Jews should be made slaves to work the land. Augustine's last 30 years are lived in an empire that is crumbling. While it has been the greatest empire up to that time, it cannot hold itself together. They are fighting wars constantly in the east against Persia and in the north against the Goths and the Vandals and a number of barbaric tribes. And eventually, they would lose. Now, I want to turn this back to Arius again. Arius and Athanasius are long gone by now. There was a man by the name of Ulphilus who came from one of the barbarian territories and studied under one of the uh, Christian bishops, an Arian bishop. Ulphilus wants to take the Bible to his homeland, the Goths, the barbarians. One problem is they don't have a written language. They really are barbarians. <laughs> they have a verbal language, but a spoken language, but not a written language. So Ulphilus has to first develop a written language that they can understand, which he does. He then translates the Bible, uh, all Old and New Testament, so that he can bring that to his people. Where is, hang on. Well, I've lost it here. Anyway. Oh, here it is. He didn't translate all of it because he thought some of it was too violent for the barbarians, knowing the barbarians well. He decided that maybe First and Second Kings might be a little too earthy for them. So he leaves out First and Second Kings. So the Goths never read about Ahab attacking Ben-Hadad, who is in his tent getting drunk with his generals. That's in 1 Kings 20. And they don't read about Jezebel being trampled by horses until there's nothing left of Jezebel but skull, hands, and feet, 2 Kings 9. He may have made a good decision. However, thinking about how the Roman Empire fell, it fell to the Goths, who are now Arian Christians. Thinking about the sacking Rome, the Orthodox Christians must have been horrified that the Arians are back again. But the barbarians are more interested in sharpening swords than they are in, in the, theological discussions, and so they let the Orthodox Church just have its own way and never, never bring up the Arian controversy again. Uh, he gave us, Augustine gave us about 100 books and writings on a wide range of theology. One of his books was called Confessions. It was an early book when he fully confessed all of his sins that he did when he was younger, having a great time in Carthage. Um, but he didn't, he didn't write it as a way of confessing. He wrote it as, as a way of telling people how not to live, if you you can put it that way. Uh, he wrote a book called On the Trinity. You can imagine what that subject is. And he wrote Of Free Will, Of Free Choice of the Will, that addresses why God would give us choices to do evil. Scholars have called Augustine the second most important Christian after Paul. And I would add, if you're talking about theology, 
Yeah. I still say that Constantine was pretty important. While I don't know that he was such a great Christian, he certainly made the Roman Empire free, or made Christians um, free. So, with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. I may not know the answer, but I'll try. <laughs> any? No? I've got um, a comment that might uh, fit with when you said that they believe that the Jews converted to Christianity. When you said that, I was trying to research over here. I wonder if that goes back to the prophet Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. I just found it where the prophetic word was that the, the concept of the Messiah would come and the people of God, the Jews, would look on him whom they had pierced. And the early Christian church took that to be a reference to Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously the prophet didn't understand Christ, but they took it that way. And I wonder if that's part of the early Christian church movement, Roger, thinking that the Jews would convert to mm -hmm. Christianity with some prophetic words like that, the way they interpret it, interpreted yeah. them. Well, I don't know. Like I said, I, I didn't read any reason why Augustine believed that, but I suspect it probably was based on Scripture somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think he just pulled these things out of his head. Right. So, it's possible. Excellent. Well, we're going to close out, and we're going to start again next week. I need those ladies and any other women that want to join with me for some special, few mo just a few moments of prayer. Let's put our hands together once again for Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you give to us and what a wonderful season of study that we have been a part of. Your blessings upon each and every one of us now as we go our separate ways. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Have a marvelous evening.